Thanks everybody for showing up for our third and final night of our Salesforce Architect series. So we've got a special guest tonight, Tom Cozzolino, Senior Director of Market Strategy at Salesforce. And he's gonna be telling us more about how architects can embrace the fourth industrial revolution. I think before everybody joined, he was telling us a fun fact about uh, how he got into the gelato business. I don't know, maybe we can convince him to tell us more about that. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and pass the mic over to Tom. Great. Thank you, Daniel. I assume you all can hear me okay, right? Give me a thumbs up. Yes, awesome, great. My name's Tom Casolino, and as, as Daniel said, I work for Salesforce. I'm a senior director in the market strategy team. What that means is I get to talk to customers partners and parts of the of Salesforce community and really dig deep into what the platform is about. I'm all about platform. That's why I came to Salesforce over eight years ago. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about architectures and what we call modern architectures in the Salesforce language. So before we get started, I have to do the requisite uh, forward looking statement. Uh, I may touch on a couple of roadmap items. Um, so obviously make all of your purchasing decisions based on currently available product. The second thing I also have to do is kind of ask, how, how are you guys doing? Um, we're, we live in different times. You live in exciting, strange, sometimes scary times. And I hope you're all taking care of yourselves, your family, and your loved ones, and anyone else that you need uh, to, to take care of. Um, I'll say a couple things at the end of the presentation about what Salesforce is doing to help our customers and the community. But please know that we all are feeling for you. We're trying our best as well as a company, both to, uh, to take care of you and making sure that we're doing everything we can to help, um, help get us through some of the harder times that we're seeing right now. So the agenda today or tonight is gonna to be kind of fourfold. I'll talk a little bit about digital transformation because in, I'm not gonna get all high muckety muck with you guys. It's gonna be some pretty hard hitting things around what we're seeing out there in, uh, in, the, uh, in the industry, in the marketplace, around what is digital transformation really adding up to? And also along with that, what are the technical trends that are really making themselves known in architecture and in technology today? Because I think they really are coming together in a way that's both exciting, challenging, and gives each of you an opportunity to either redefine your career or extend it or make it something wonderful and new and specific to you. Second, we'll talk about it's time for modern architectures. First of all, what are they? We'll talk about that. Why do you care? And how do you get started? How do you get thinking about it? And in that section, I'll put a little bit of, uh, of color is how Salesforce actually uh, is, is undertaking a modern architecture's internal transformation ourselves. So I think it's interesting to tell, tell you things about the outside world, but we're actually doing this ourselves internally. The third thing is, you know, so, so what? I, I'm, I'm known to say that, so what, when people tell me things, because I do wanna know, you know, what should I do with that information? What are my next steps? Well, how can I make this actionable and useful in my daily life? So we'll talk a little bit about what can you do to start your modern architecture's journey, because it is a journey, it is a transformation. And finally, we do a little bit of wrap up in questions and answers as there is time. If there's something burning that you need to know that is non-gelato related, please, um, uh, you know, somebody interrupt me, Jody, uh, Daniel, Cynthia, interrupt me, and I'm happy to take, take the questions. However, I'd like to kind of finish, uh, finish my spiel, if you will, and then we'll talk later. Okay, the first thing, and this is a little bit of the of Captain Obvious reporting for duty, but change will never be as slow as it is today. A lot of things are happening out there, correct? I mean, emerging technology is expanding like crazy. So you've got everything from quantum computing and 5G and, and artificial intelligence, of course, things like that. And just look at the, the impact of some of these technical changes on what we're doing and how we're sort of living our lives. And how are we doing these, these types of events without internet, mobile, and, and telecommunications, what they are, we'd, we'd be yelling across the parking lot to each other, right? So there are some super huge changes happening right now. And um, this is from uh, the CEO of VMware a couple of years ago. You know, um, change is gonna, gonna keep going faster and faster because of technology and because of both the hunger for people to absorb it and you know, companies and providers and even and you, you yourselves building on you know, nice technology to make it even better and better. 
And I guess the question is, are you and your enterprise ready for this? And this is more than just change management, project management, you know, uh, adoption of technology. It's also reskilling. It's also looking at things with fresh viewpoints and fresh eyes. So change is, is awesome. And if, you, if you're a fan of change, you, you know, you, you are living in the right time. Now, as we talk to a lot of CEOs, they come to Salesforce, they come to, to my team and others, and they're saying, listen, you know, we, how do we get to integrated customer experiences? Besides the jargon, what does that really mean to me as a manufacturer or me as an electronics maker, me as a retailer? What does that really mean? And what is that experience really all about? Um, really shifting away from cranking product out to really thinking about customers. This is kind of Salesforce's stock and trade since you know, almost day one, but it's interesting to see how other people in the, in the industry and in other industries are starting to talk about customer first. So that's great. Um, the notion of ecosystems and communities. I mean, I am um, honored to be part of this ecosystem tonight and, and as I do my job. And you guys are doing a fantastic job to help push and pull and, and help your own, your own uh, enterprises as well as others adopt and change uh, as we move ahead. The second thing CEOs are asking us about, hey, Salesforce, how do we build customer first thinking in, in cultures? How do we build trust into everything we do? You hear about Salesforce's number one value being trust, and we'll talk a, a lot about that later and how that manifests. But CEOs are like, I want a piece of that. I need to understand for my own uh, survival and my company's survival and growth, how do I get through some of this stuff and how do I build trust, maybe in some industries that don't have it? And how do I embrace constant learning in, in collaboration? And finally, technology, we, we're now seeing CEOs as being, uh, you know, chief uh, digital transformation officers. That's new. In the old days, they said, listen, I'm, I'm just going to go lead the company. You guys figure out, you ladies figure some of the stuff out. But they're really saying, you know what, I need to do digital transformation as the head of my company. Finally, citizen development, that's something that, that you are very well aware of. And sort of modular approaches to data. We know we can't build the big monolith anymore. But how do we go about taking a, a critical eye both to what we have already and as we stagger into the future, how do we make it better and frankly get out of the mess we're in into a mess that's a little easier to get out of you know, still in the future. So CEOs are coming to us and saying, help Salesforce, what, what do I do? And as I said, technology trends also are, are feeding their way into the mix and they are just exploding the number type and sort of disruption of the type of, of opportunities that are coming to us. First of all, experience is really talked about that a little bit. IT, right, the people, you, you and your, uh, your, your teams, how do they, how do you approach you know, the, the, these never ending needs from customers, employees and partners so that they're happy, so that they keep paying the bills and they keep coming to you for more of the, of the, the awesomeness that you provide. The second thing is platform choices. There are a lot of great technology partners out there. Salesforce does a lot of great stuff, but there are many, many others. I'm sure you can name them. And so CIOs and CTOs, as they try to find their way through this maze, they're going to say, I'm going to put some strategic bets on a couple of platforms. I can't have six or seven. I can probably have two, maybe three. So how do you choose among that, among those, those players? A lot, of, uh, a lot of work, a lot of angst to try to figure some of that stuff out. The third, what is the future of app dev? We are big believers that the, the developer persona or personae are, are, is going to really be disrupted over the next three to five years. Developers of tomorrow are not going to be coding hardcore as much as they are today. They're not going to be, you know, even configuring endpoints. They're going to be taking, like, minority report. They're going to be taking things, moving them around, and composing things. I think that's a really important, interesting, and exciting trend. A couple other things, data, data, data. We all know about how fast data is going, et cetera. But as you, as you and your enterprises grapple with these uh, data lakes or data swamps, how do you figure out where to put what? How do you make sure that the data is protected from GDPR and other styles of, of compliance regulations and things like that? And finally, this is the trailhead message, frankly, but help is wanted. There's too much to do. It's too hard to do it. And I don't have enough people. So how do I upskill and, and reskill people so that I can, again, continue to take advantage of the opportunities that are out there for me? So you might say, as our architects to the rescue with this stuff, well, it's yes and no. 
because, you know, architecture used to mean stuff like this, right? And I don't know if any of you know what a compatibility matrix are, you probably is, you probably do, but this is one I actually put together in the last, my last big, giant, awful, nasty, big, fat, hairy project that was an on-prem thing. This is uh, actually a, a real uh, compatibility matrix across my components that I was trying to lash together to build a global wealth management platform. The red is what happens when one of them, you know, on the x-axis breaks. It's what happens to the, the y-axis. So um, this is not a good place to be, but sometimes architects in the old days and probably some of, of you and some people I know are still grappling with some of this stuff. This is what architecture kind of used to be. Or the flip side, a lot of architects that, again, I was one back in, in my youth. Um, I was the white, uh, you know, sort of the ivory tower architect, right? So I, I sat there, I, I made these beautiful pictures and I said, ta-da, there you go, go build this. That's not what architecture is becoming either. So, you, you know, it's, it's important to do knowledge transfer and, and make sure that your ideas can be both documented, captured and used. But at the end of the day, how do I take that, that concept and both make it into something actionable and also communicate it in a way that can be understood and scaled as well. So architects have, um, have a, a, an amazing opportunity, but I think there needs to be a bit of rethinking on how we, we handle the big picture writ large. And I think that means it's time for modern architectures. And so, okay, we're getting to it. What do we mean and kind of why do we care? So as we look at both the business drivers we talked a little bit about from the CEO's perspective, and technical trends we talked about as well. This is kind of the, some of the characteristics of architectures in the last, I don't know, 10, 20, maybe 10, 15 years. Um, if you remember business process redesign was a big deal, everybody was doing that. And that was kind of what people led with. What are the key processes in your organization? Let's start there. Um, let's build some apps. That was the next thing. Gotta build apps, gotta build apps. Um, but it was by the few, it was only those skilled, C Sharp, C++, Java developers, they're the only ones who could actually build apps back then, right? Again, back then might have been as recent as a couple of years ago. Um, we would build features, right? The, my, I, I'd have my epics and, my, and my, uh, my stories and I'd build features, right? And I would build, obviously build them, not compose them. And I would build systems um, to get to some sort of an end state and complete my project. That's a great way of thinking. Again, that was a great way of thinking. But we think that if you want to really get to a customer transformation mode, if you really want to get to a place in a time that you can in, empower your, your enterprise to kind of take flight, it's going to be this style of thinking. So we're going to get to a journey-based way of doing things. Um, we're going to have digital experiences that really are built or composed by the many, not just by, again, the, the experts that have advanced degrees in computer science. We're going to build up capabilities versus features, and we're gonna build on those digital platforms and we're gonna continually evolve to, to crank, not to crank out, but to both produce and, and, and uh, grow and nurture digital projects, um, digital products, excuse me. So that's, I think, the opportunity for IT. So the def definition of modern architectures for us kind of goes this, and it's a long sentence. A customer obsessed way of enabling all people to use capabilities to compose journeys and experiences on platforms to create products that continually evolve. Now, need a little oxygen after that, but the net net I think is pretty important. It is an inclusive way of doing composition and next gen thinking around all this goodness that we've had about componentry and about integration and about services and about serverless. We'll talk a little bit about that also. How do we assemble this stuff in a way that is scalable, meets the needs that we're being asked to, to meet and not breaking the bank from a dollars or time or frankly patients perspective from the people that are supposed to be using our systems, right? Or our products. So in Salesforce line, which we, uh, modern architectures kind of are manifest themselves in the customer 360 platform. So what that means is that's something that's a marketing term for us. You probably have heard this at, at Dreamforce and other, um, you know, other Salesforce um, events. Um, but they, they kind of looks like this. So the CEO loves this kind of nomenclature in, in how this thing stacks up. So the CTO and CAO, because this is how they think, right? They know they need apps or experiences. They know they need an ecosystem. 
They know they need learning and adoption if they're gonna scale both how they, they create these experiences and how the people that are, um, are, are using them are gonna stay sharp and, and on top of their game. And then our platform services, and this again, a bit, bit of a laundry list, but mobile, blockchain, AI, security, et cetera. This is what you know, the, the C-level technologists like, and that's great, but the, there's another end of it, right? What's underneath all of this? So that's where solution architects and admins, developers, that this is, this is the, 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 the ham sandwich, if you will, or the layer cake comes into, into uh, realization. We've got compute and runtime. We've got integration, data, UI, and developer services. And I think if you think about how we stack up, again, it's a, it's a concept. We'll get to some of the detail in a moment. But I think it, it's something we can walk around with. So instead of having the pretty pictures that have, have all the wires on it, we have, you know what, here's some slabs of, of capabilities that we're going to pull together in ways, again, that we couldn't, you know, as, as recently as a couple of years ago. So that's kind of what modern architectures are comprised of. And the point of view, frankly, and what is this, you know, it's, again, here's the first so what. So what? Well, these, this type of point of view, this way of walking around and talking about this, help really drives organizations both ability and hunger to thrive. So it has these four pieces around the, uh, around the outside. It is context. It's all about customer context. How do I go and figure out, you know, am I in the middle of, a, of an order? Is, is someone have a case that they need, um, you know, sorted out and they're coming in from a different channel? What's the context of, um, uh, of, of my thinking? Finally, it's all about teams. And these are more than just technical teams. We, are, we have business leaders. We have, you know, outside partners. We have all kinds of other subject matter experts are coming together. And so that is the ohana, you know, as you start talking about modern architectures. And finally, the ecosystem is what keeps us going because you folks are going to be the ones coming up with a lot of the ideas that we either haven't had the time or haven't thought of yet. And that's what makes the, the Salesforce ecosystem such a multiplier. So let's, how do we do some of this? So how has Salesforce taken some of these concepts and baked them into um, are, you know, the way we go to market. Again, I think you can pull away some of the lessons learned, you know, in your own lives as well. So the first thing is alignment. You, you, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with Salesforce's V2 mom, but frankly, this is more than just an exercise for us. This is something that keeps our teams, and again, at, at 50,000 people, it's hard to keep everybody even in the same general direction. So the notion of a vision and values, methods, et cetera, that are linked, you know, from you know, frankly, Mark Benioff all the way down and across the organization is super important. So how do you do this? You know, how, how are your teams organized and how do you write a contract or something that's going to help them uh, and you kind of stay on the same page, especially right in times like this when priorities are changing and the dynamic nature of what we do is um, increasing day by day. The second, how do you build for scale? I mean, for, for in our perspective, we had to scale since, again, since we started. And you see some of these, these crazy numbers, both for Cyber Week last year uh, on the green side and then the blue side, you know, kind of what we're, we're seeing in, in a 24-hour 24 um, hour period. And, and again, I always like to plan for things larger than they need to be because if, if you're in, the, in a bare minimum from a capacity perspective, you, and you, you probably want to be successful, so you have to build a bit of headroom in there as well. So building for scale kind of is, is motherhood and apple pie to, to architects. The next one is really living the values. And this is about trust, um, at least, or whatever values you happen to embody. So for us, transparency is super important as well. So we've got you know, trust.salesforce.com. And this, I think, is important both from a pragmatic perspective of, is my instance up? Hey, is my performance where it needs to be, et cetera? But it also shows that you know, we know we're going to make mistakes. We know we're gonna fall down. We might even fail our customers, but we're not gonna hide that. We're gonna get up and, and face the music, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a couple more slides. But it, being trustworthy and transparent and just walking that walk, I think, um, again, it's gonna end up in repeat business for you, no matter what business or what, what function you happen to be in. Um, in the, this slide used to say innovation culture. I think it's integration culture is even better um, and more apt because, you know, we've done a lot of organic uh, M&A activities as well as, um, you know, uh, uh, not inorganic. And but really every time we bring um, 
uh, people in, even if it's hiring one person, we have to both value where they came from and help them understand kind of how we do things, but also say, what do you think? How do you help us be better than we were? So again, as you look across this bubble, set of bubbles of, um, of acquisitions, et cetera, and, and big product announcements, you see that we've had to continually kind of zigzag and morph both culturally from a product perspective and how we approach the market. And I, again, if you can kind of learn to be off balance a little bit when things like this happen, when there is a big change or a big disruption, you're all that more better positioned not to get, you know, not to panic because pan panic isn't fun. Panic is bad. And obviously moving fast and deliver, you know, the, the three releases a year, you know, we've, we've talked about that forever and ever, amen. But it, moving quickly in getting, I guess, again, the MVP way of thinking, but also continually checking back with your stakeholders, your customers, super, super important as, again, as architects think through um, what they don't know as they try to deliver. And finally, take your lumps. Um, I talked about listening and being transparent. Um, when, uh, when Brett Taylor, who's our, new, our president and chief product officer, when he came to the company, um, you know, I think he was there maybe a year, year and change. Um, we had some issues with the idea exchange, if you know um, that story. Uh, if you don't, um, click on this link later and I, in the mean tweet, watch the mean tweet uh, video. It's, it's instructive and fun. And, and um, SpaceX will have humans on Mars before Salesforce gives up about any of the good ideas on this portal. So, and again, standing up, hey, we screwed up. We weren't responsive. We need to be more responsive. That's the way to do it. Because again, that means, hey, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I make mistakes every day. And if I face up to them, um, you know, my family, my friends, you know, and, and my, my manager will give me another chance versus trying to, trying to hide it. So again, um, kind of, again, kind of obvious, but I think showing that, um, is something architects need to do too, because we make design, you know, mistakes more, more than uh, a little bit. And finally, the modern architecture's manifesto. If you're in a fourth industrial revolution, you need a manifesto, I think. So these, these are things I'd love you, for you to take back and think through, um, because I think they should be your demands back to us. Um, first, you know, you, you need to be heard by Salesforce. Again, we talked about the idea exchange a little bit, but both, you know, you, telling providers like us what, what you need, and also people on your team, the diversity uh, across your team. You need to hear and listen. Um, and what is the voice of the customer? Super, super important. Second, you know, design. You know, how many, how many times have you been asked to build something and you don't design, you don't do a design, you just kind of start coding it? Mm. Okay, that's important, but how do you do, how do you get to an operating model that has design as, as kind of in the DNA? And how do, you, how do you stay accountable for some of that? Um, we'll go fast. You have to go fast. Speed is, speed is it right now, uh, especially in, in these times. And so how do you, you know, continue to build that MVP muscle and obviously go to a services or, or other sort of you know, uh, container-focused way of thinking? Legacy needs to work for you. I'm sure you have, you know, I don't want to say the, the M word, maybe you have mainframes in your shop or AS400s. I was talking to a customer with AS400s today. Crazy. Um, you know, or even, you know, this old stuff that hangs around. The legacy needs to work for you, not the other way around. So how do you do surround strategies on those old, you know, dusty but valuable investments? And how do you federate the data into and out of them? Super important. I think you must ask us to make this easier for you. It's too hard to build apps still. It's too hard, too hard to manage them. We need more abstraction, more composability, more ways to pull things together again quickly, easily, and safely as well. Um, obviously, the reskilling piece, I think my trailhead and trailhead are great examples of that. We need to continue to push the envelope. A couple other things you need to be safe. You don't want to be, um, uh, you know, defense in depth is a D and D. You don't want to end up on the, the, uh, the, for the front page of uh, the, or the cover of Time Magazine for the wrong, the wrong reasons, right? You have a data breach. Um, so, so obviously security is super important. You know, you can be heroes, but only just for one day uh, because you need to really tap into automation and AI, right? I mean, if you're still scripting the same stuff you did four years ago, you want things to get easier and you want the drudgery jobs to go downstream and have some smart computer take care of it instead of your valuable people. 
And also, we will not be wrong, or uh, we'll be not wrong. There's a difference between being right and being not wrong. It's kind of hard to be right these days. If you ask me what is the solution for a particular technical problem, I'll give you a solution. But you know what? It's probably not right, but I want it to be not wrong. I want it to be directionally correct. I want to be able to change it and, and sort of deal with the, the unknown known, uh, the unknown unknowns or the known unknowns, because I know things are going to change over time. That's where metadata as a manifestation of this really comes to the table. So again, listen, you know, let these wash over you. And I love to have conversations after this. Um, tell me where I go wrong and what other demands do you have that I haven't captured here? Because it's all about you folks being, being productive and being successful. That's the only way we are the same as well. So modern architecture kind of brings things into focus. This is another attempt at the layer cake, but I think it makes sense from an architectural perspective from a solution side. And so you've got data, you've got integration, intelligence, engagement, and the, sort of the experience layer. So we start to pull together um, some of the capabilities or the jobs that, that customers need to do into this framework. And I've used this a bunch of different times, both to, again, to communicate with executives, but also communicate with the development teams and the architecture teams. So they say, wait a minute, what am I using for process orchestration here? We'll talk a little bit about this in, in, uh, in action a bit later. But to think this way as, as a, a stack of things and not, and all these are not gonna be Salesforce things. That's, you know, it's okay. Um, but when you start thinking about architectures in, in the next generation, how do you pull pieces together that make sense, that aren't gonna break the bank, and again, are gonna allow you to deliver in a way that is fast as well as safe. So, so what? How do you start your modern architecture's journey? Um, and again, it is a journey. It's not gonna be something you're gonna be done with, you know, in, in a quarter or two. And part of that is really the CEO's mandate, if you remember way back, that little triangle about, about culture, about technology and transformation. So there's a great book, and my first plug for a book is something called Design for Digital. I'll wait for this to clear. There you go. Whoops. Whoops. There we go. Um, if you look at the, so there's a great book called Design for Digital by um, a friend of ours, uh, Jeannie Ross, who's out of MIT. And basically, you know, digital transformation is this big, great, cool concept. But the book and the, um, the case study she uses really drives at home, I think, both for architects or anyone in technology who wanted to look at and understand how to a product skin the cat, so to speak. And so the wheel kind of goes like this. At the bottom is your, is your operational backbone. This might be called your data layer. And, and that is how, you, how are you running your business from a systems perspective? Probably is ERP, financial systems, Salesforce might be a systems of record of that operational backbone. And really understanding where the data lives, who owns it, how is it cared for, is it good enough? Uh, you know, can you trust it to close your books at the end of the month, etc. Operational backbone, super, super important. To the left, shared customer insights. Um, the voice of the customer, again, something really, really important uh, and, and uh, uh, top of mind for us. But as you think about digital transformation, again, in your own portfolios, what, who are your customers? I mean, maybe internal customers, external customers, partners, et cetera. But what kind of offerings do they really want to pay for? Which ones are really going to be important to them? If you don't know that, again, you're sort of building stuff that people may not want or may not need. And again, sort of wasted time and effort for everybody. Um, we talked about digital platforms. Um, again, componentry and digital platforms that are forward thinking and, and forward facing, I think, Super, super important. So how are you gonna make those, those distinctions? How are you gonna make those, uh, those selections? And I think that's a, a critical part of, of the architect's um, Cuisinart that they're gonna put things through. The next one is an accountability framework. You know, so who owns this stuff? You know, you, IT doesn't now no longer builds and maintains everything, right? You're pulling pieces in from ActiveChange, you're buying things from Salesforce, you're probably using infrastructure from other providers, et cetera. So who, how, do you, how do you provide accountability for that, both from the, on the vendor level and sort of the, the subsystem level and on the product level, the, the digital products that you are delivering? And accountability I like better than governance. Governance feels um, too, too narrow for me. Accountability, I think, is a better way to think about it. 
And finally, the external developer and, and customer platform. So this is the ecosystem. And again, it's going to be Salesforce, hopefully, but it's going to be other things as well. How do you manage that? And how do you grow those tribes, if you will, of passionate adopters? I know you folks are all passionate Salesforce adopters, but SIs and ISVs, how do you pull this stuff together in a way that you're you're promoting the right set of behaviors inside those ecosystems and leveraging them in ways that make sense. So again, just the plug on the book, um, Jeannie goes through, you know, Schneider Electric and, uh, whole, and, and QuickBooks uh, and a bunch of other really interesting companies and in, kind of shows how they have approached their digital transformation. Again, it's not a Salesforce heavy book, but it is a great way to both walk around again with the vocabulary that's useful, but also gives you some real things to think about. Again, instead of look, uh, uh, boiling the ocean and looking at that in a big deal, you can break it into pieces um, uh, that fit your situation. And the other thing is, again, the layer cake that we had a, a few slides back. What we've done in, at Salesforce uh, and the architecture teams is we, we walk around and we, when we talk to customers and help them figure out what they want to do from a phased approach, um, around the digital transformation, we'll start to map for each layer. Um, what are the main capabilities or main types of functionality that they're going to bring to the table? And again, as you see here, a lot of these are not Salesforce technologies, and that's that's okay. I think in years past, we tried to make everything look like Salesforce would do a force fit. But now, again, given the heterogeneity of the world, it's really important that the sunken investments that you and your, your customers or your your own companies have made, they're leveraged to the hilt, but then we can add that agility layer on top. We can add MuleSoft to do the right set of, of choreography and orchestration, and then we can pump that out to you know, different channels, you know, via Einstein voice or other types of technologies. So um, I've, again, I've done these for any number of, of, uh, of different industries and different use cases. And, and again, that uh, that communication, which is what architects are supposed to do, they're supposed to go between both the developers and, and sort of the, the executives and kind of play translation instead of whisper down the lane and help people understand, here's what we're trying to get done, here's what the tooling we're gonna to use, and here's part of how to go and actually start building these solutions in real life. And that's a hard job. Again, if you are, whether you're a solution architect, um, a senior developer, or an enterprise architect, I think you know what I'm trying to say. These are hard communication issues because sometimes the, uh, uh, the executive doesn't understand the tech and sometimes the, the, uh, the more uh, junior developers don't understand why you're doing something from a business perspective. So there's a lot of family therapy going on if you're in the architecture business. But that's at least a couple of things to get started with. Okay, as, as I wrap up, I'd like to uh, throw a couple of other ideas and in, in some um, uh, information your way. The first is, um, again, this kind of goes back to what I said at the beginning about how are you all doing. Um, if there are, um, we, Salesforce has done a lot of work during the, in, in the last couple of months, both to, to help understand where the industry is going and to do our bet, or our bit, excuse me, to try to help. So um, go, go to you know, sforce.co slash care if you haven't already and have a look you know, for things for your leaders, for your employees and for your customers. And again, we're here to help and we're really, um, you know, genuinely interested in the challenges you're having and how we can help. Again, from a technical perspective is great, but you know, everything from communication templates and, and how do you go about, you know, grappling with some of the more um, human issues uh, as we go through um, some of the challenges of today. So please go there and have a look. And again, you know, the, the tech is, is free, you know, again, I'm not patting ourselves on the back, but it's important that we make it easy for people to start adopting some of this again for their particular um, their particular situations, and there's even there's more there's um and I'll get you these links later you know the the uh, this V2 mom video there's there's SIC briefings that's our um, you know uh, the uh, kind of used to be the EBCs back in the day and also there's a bunch of virtual events that we continue to host as well this being one of them um, so again there's a lot of of tools um, that we want to we want you to try and tell us what we're missing. So please, um, you know, you've got the, uh, uh, you know, you know, Daniel and Jody and Cynthia to uh, get information back to me. My my contact info is there as well. So please um, take advantage of this and, and let's get through this together and let's do our best to uh, to be safe and and happy. 
Um, one last thing, um, um, if you are an architect or you, anything I've said sparks any sort of interest in you, these are three really good books to read. The Design for Digital is a Jeannie Ross book that I talked about. Um, and again, it is really, um, it's not a geeky book, nor is it a boring, high level, high falluting management consulting book. It's pretty pragmatic. And it really, um, again, I can't say enough good things about, about Jeannie. She and, and I go back a bunch of years, um, just a, a, a super, super clear thinker, which I think we need these days. The second is Competing Against Luck. If you've, if you've read anything by Clay Christensen, um, the uh, Innovator's Dilemma is all, all his as well. Um, and he talks about jobs to be done. So instead of, I need to buy a database, you say, wait a minute, what job do I need to do? Um, and who am I gonna hire? What am I gonna hire to do this job? So if I need you know, a, um, a fall tolerant or highly available uh, data store so that I can uh, build context services, that's the better way of saying that than I need a database. So, um, and you, you look to hire components for a job and if they work, you know, you keep buying them and if they don't, you dump them and find somebody else. So again, really interesting book, again, for, for some at-home reading. And finally, Brene Brown is another one of my favorites, Dare to Lead, if you're a leader, and I'll bet everybody on this call is a leader. You know, how do you, in, in times where, where it is challenging, how do you be brave about speaking up and being vulnerable, but also, you know, getting the job done in a human way? And I, I think that um, if there's one sort of, uh, silver lining in some of the, the challenges we have is that it feels like people are, are taking a step back and thinking about how they're, they're acting like humans finally, um, at least for me. And um, it, it's just great to see people coming together in, in new ways, again, both to help each other, help themselves and help their companies, you know, get through. Because at the end of the day, we're all just human beings trying to, trying to get, you know, you know, get to the end of the day so that we can have a glass of wine like Jody's having. Um, so that is, that is all I have. Um, I would love to have further discussions or, or comments and questions, but I will stop talking now and listen. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Any questions, any comments? Are you awake? Yeah, we have one question for you. Yes. Yes. Can you clarify the term architect, technical architect, solution architect, enterprise architect, yes. architect, all the things? That is, a, and we were talking before this call started about the overloaded term architect. Um, George Costanza comes to mind if you know, you remember who George Costanza was, wanted to be an architect. But in, in my mind, I was thinking more of an enterprise architect or a, a solution architect for, for most of this. Now, that doesn't mean if you're not either of those titles, because people call themselves everything these days, that means you can't think this way. That is untrue. I think everybody brings this should bring a sense of architecture to what they do. And that means things like, you know, the, um, the, the voice of the customer being top of mind. It means bringing the right set of people in across the ecosystem. It is about um, kind of trying to future proof yourself by building scale into what you do, building testing and automation into what you do, and just making sure that you're being smart about building or composing or architecting, if that makes sense. So I think it, 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 again, I think like an enterprise architect, that's my, um, my, my past, but I think that a lot of what I spoke about could be applied to anyone who is crafting technology solutions, if that makes sense. So we had Stephen here a couple of days ago and part of what he said um, in being an architect was managing people issues as well. So what do you think the split is between managing people versus technology issues? Now that's going to be an, as a as a former um, consultant. That means it depends is the answer, the short answer. The longer answer is um, it does really depend on how. If, if you're a um, a component architect and you're building a small piece of a a larger experience, then you probably are, are you know 80, 70, 70 percent tech and 20, 30 percent people because everybody has at least 20 or 30 percent people or else. You know, you, you, I don't think you can do anything really without collaborating effectively. Um, as you go up or over the chain, I, as you get as you get paid too much up the up the scale, as we like to say, um, you do more people and less technology. And so, I think an enterprise architect is probably probably fifty fifty. So, I'd imagine a solution architect is probably 
mm, you know, 60, 40 ish, 60 being people, 40 uh, being tech. Um, it's going to vary depending on, um, you know, are, are you building old style Java apps or are you building component based drag and drop low code apps? So I think, I think that the net net is um, the more composable we are, I think the more people focused we're going to be. But I, you still need to have pretty deep technology skills, both to do the selection and, and also figure out when it's time to do a zig or a zag based on some new trends. So what would you say in terms of customers that are much smaller shops, right? So maybe they're a 10, 15, 20 seat shop mm -hmm. versus like a really giant enterprise, right? So some of these things might be a little bit overkill. How would you tailor some of that to a smaller shop? Yeah, that is a great question. Always look at um, what, are the, what are the pain points you're trying to solve or what are the, what's the scope of the solution or solutions that you're trying to compose. Based on that, you know, again, I still think some of the, the basics still apply around scale, around testing, around automation, around being smart and shrewd about how you're selecting your technology. I think that's really important. And frankly, all the things about what I think you should be demanding of Salesforce, I don't care what you do, you should be demanding that we make things easier for you, that we make things more secure for you, transparent. I mean, you should be screaming about that to every one of your um, uh, uh, the people that you actually give money to. But above and beyond that, the, the motherhood and apple pie doesn't go away of good design, of scale, of testing, of communication, and of collaboration, both um, you know, with your internal teams and your ultimate stakeholder, the ones that are going to be using the stuff that you're trying to uh, put together. Great. So another question here, what are the biggest challenges do you see that companies face with the fourth industrial revolution and maybe even some trends? Yeah, well, I went through some of the trends um, around data, around experiences, around, uh, uh, you know, talent, finding talent. I think the biggest one is, and I think there's a stat, roughly 70, I think there was a Deloitte study, something like 70, 80% of digital transformation projects are failing. And I think part of it is because they don't have, and sorry to say this, it's going to sound corny, they don't have the customer at the center of what they do. They're either trying to say, we got to get digital. Okay, well, what are we going to do? Let's do a website. Let's do some, some uh, mobile apps. Let's have a online experience, whatever that means. <sighs> getting with the customers, getting with the people that are, you're allegedly are trying to serve and really understanding and being, again, being vulnerable and being transparent about uh, if you don't know what they want and you're going to guess, you'll probably be wrong. So I, I think, um, uh, the, the hardest part is really getting at, at what you want to be when you grow up. And then the second is how do you, how do you chunk that out in bite-sized pieces that you can test and, and hopefully fail fast or succeed fast? Great. So a couple of questions here. One is um, how possible is it for us to keep up with the ever increasing pace of change? Or if you have any suggestions on that, and at what point do we just accept that we can't? I don't think we ever accept that, Daniel. Well, we, there is, and you'll, I might get beat up on this, but there's, there's the notion of good enough sometimes too. Um, you know, there is good enough. And I think um, there's big, there's big decisions and there's less big decisions. I think data, how you, how you manage and, respect and deal with data, I think that's kind of a big deal. Um, I'm less worried about languages and stuff. I think we can insulate ourselves as that continues on. Um, but, and also we have so much technical debt. You know, sometimes you do the Gordian knot, you, you, you just cut the damn thing. Um, it, it's okay to throw things away sometimes too. Um, we can't throw away our, you know, our AS400, yeah, you, maybe not tomorrow, but you can surround it and start choking it piece by piece. I mean that in a nice way. And you can start depriving it of data, let's just say that. And then it will finally be unimportant or immaterial or just another, just pulling stuff out of that data well. So I think there are ways to insulate. Um, I think that the whole notion of, of container-based ways of thinking, of serverless ways of thinking, and we're, we're in, in, in that world as well. That helps to deal with some of this crazy change. Um, but I mean, the thing to do is experiment, maybe 10, 20% of the time. 
Um, and then every year, I mean, when the big things happen, let, let other people, you know, hang themselves on the barbed wire of, of you know, being customer one or two or, or adopter one or two. Um, and then be a fast follower. I think that's a great thing to kind of bear in mind. So some of that might have been contradictory, but I think that's how I would attack it in those three or four buckets. So segueing from that, you you mentioned something about legacy systems before, and then again, you mentioned, you know, basically AS400, any kind of legacy yeah. system. Of There's a lot of politics that generally surround that, right? So you're putting people who have done the same things out of a job, even though you're really not. There's plenty of opportunities. Like what is... What, is, what are some of the stances that Salesforce takes in that and how do they facilitate some of those conversations? Yeah, that's, that is a great question. You have to respect the people that have this, this industrial uh, uh, tribal knowledge, I like to say, right? So, you know, Fred or Mary Lou, they've been working on the AS400 for, you know, 30 years and it was, they brought it in, et cetera. So being respectful of that is, is a good thing. And, but they, it's not the AS400 that gives, again, gives their identity value. It's what they know about the business. So what they know about solving problems. So what they know about, um, you know, where some of the intellectual bodies are buried in a sense. So I think that's a great way of taking the people. You'd be hard, be hard on the tech, but easy on the people. And part of that is, again, respecting where they came from, their, their, their great contributions to your enterprise. But then, you know, give them start harvesting or start having them be the, um, the mentor to the next generation about, again, the, the business processes and the, the, the institutional knowledge, that's the word I was looking for earlier, that, so that they can still feel valuable and, and they won't put up so many barriers. The other thing is, you know, don't ever say we're getting rid of this or we're gonna start leveraging this because it is hard to, to maintain. It might be brittle, it might be difficult and expensive to keep it around as is, but again, both the lessons you learn, the data that lives there, and the value that that system continues to, to bring should be recognized. Make sense? That makes perfect sense. Um, I'm gonna see if there's one last call for questions. If there's nothing else, I think if you wanted to wrap, Daniel. Oh, we have a question. How do you keep customers focused on their business needs when they offer solutions? Mm. I'm sorry, say that again. I don't know if so I The question was, how do you keep customers focused on their business needs when they offer solutions? That might be maybe around scope creep or kind of how you keep them on those objectives of what they're trying to solve for. Yeah, well, um, money talks in a sense. So if you're, if you're building something that you've got the right set of, of measures around, sometimes, you know, well, we're, we're we've, uh, I'm making this up. We created a widget and then it is, it pulled in this many millions of dollars in Q1. That's a good thing. If, if you keep, if you kept getting beat up for something you didn't deliver or something you did deliver and they want more and more, you know, when you do start the design or start that conversation, what, how are we measuring success? How do we know we're successful? If you can't answer that, you just guess it, right? I mean, we, I've seen any number of, of <laughs> in my checkered past, we built stuff that nobody used. Again, and if you don't measure the features of the usage of the features, I mean, you're just, you're praying, you're hoping against hope that something good will happen. Not a good place to be. So over time, or maybe you, you let this sprint play out or that this epic play out. The next time when you do split, sprint planning, okay, number one, how are we gonna measure this? If we can't instrument or instrument it so that it can be measured as well. And so you can look at both adoption, you can look at how much money it's, you, you spent to build that thing versus how much was, cre you know, was created in real dollars or productivity, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's the way to sneak it in, sneak in some measures if, if you don't have measures. And if you do have them and you're not happy with them, let's change them the next time around. I think that's a, a way forward. Perfect. So on that note, that's the last question. Daniel, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. All right, awesome. I guess uh, you did such a good job delivering this that <laughs> folks, uh, they got the message, they didn't need to clarify anything. So uh, thank you very much, that was great. I think it was very well delivered and very dense with information. And we've all got a lot of things to think about now. I, I posted the links to those books 
uh, in our Slack. So hopefully some folks will take a look at those. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Nice Thank job. You. Yeah, you have my email, so hey, happy to continue this discussion and uh, keep the comments coming. And thank you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much.